Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Know Before You Go, Grand Canyon, Bryce, and Zion. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Caden Deering. Caden, thank you so much for being here today and for getting us ready for a trip to the canyons. Let's dive in. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sunny. Um, I'm happy to be here um, talking with you all. I'm happy for this upcoming season and uh, ready to uh, get you all prepared to have the greatest time that you can in the American Southwest. So <clears throat> first off, we're gonna start off with a uh, couple of uh, housekeeping things here. So um, our COVID protocols have been updated as uh, we've entered the third year of the pandemic. Um, Nowadays, Natural Habitat Adventures, we are following uh, all local guidelines, um, including um, those guidelines put out by the World Health Organization. Um, we no longer require day one testing um, upon arriving at the trip. However, if guests do show signs or symptoms of COVID, we will test. And um, according to those, to the circumstances, um, we will either quarantine the guest or um, possibly send them home. So um, this is an evolving situation. Obviously uh, we will see surges in this summer um, and we will play those accordingly and you will be updated um, by the office of those guidelines change. All right, so uh, as we kind of start out here, I wanna get into uh, what makes the American Southwest so special. And I wanted to start out with a quote by one of my favorite authors, Edward Abbey, talking about his time he spent alone um, in the deserts of uh, central and southern Utah. The wind will not stop. Gusts of sand swirl before me, stinging my face. But there is still, whoop, but there is still too much to see and marvel at. The world, very much alive in the bright light and wind, exultant with the fever of spring, the delight of morning. Strolling on, it seems to me that the strangeness and the wonder of existence are emphasized here in the desert by the comparative sparsity of the flora and fauna. Life is not crowded upon life as in other places, but is scattered abroad in sparseness and in simplicity with <clears throat> generous gift of space for each herb and bush and tree each stem of grass so that the living organism stands out bold and brave and vivid against the lifeless sand and barren rock the extreme clarity of the desert light is equaled by the extreme individuation of desert life forms love flowers best in openness and freedom these are the things that we can expect in the southwest in the canyons of Grand Canyon, Bryce and Zion. Let's add a little bit of context to, to uh, where we will, we will be going, um, or for those who are interested and haven't quite booked this trip yet, where you could be going. So this is a picture here of the Colorado Plateau, a raised large geographical area with its own unique ecological systems and um, watersheds. So this plateau was raised up between about 80 million and 10 million years ago in a large geological event called the Laramie Orogeny, where the Pacific plate collided with the North American plate, thrusting up mountain ranges such as the Wasatch of central Utah and the many ranges found throughout the Four Corners region, including the Colorado Plateau. If you see my uh, small star there on the map, that is the beginning of our journey there in St. George, Utah, where all of our guests will be flying into. Um, here's a beautiful picture of the Grand Canyon. Um, this is a picture I took about a year and a half ago, um, a rather unique photo 
of an inversion that had settled in the canyon. This is a, a rare event that occurs um, when we have a lot of cool air piling on top of warmer air that shoves all of this um, cloud banks down into the canyon. Um, not often that you see this type of view, but it may occur. Another beautiful uh, shot of the sunrise at Bryce Canyon. Here you can clearly tell what Edward, Edward Abbey was talking about with the openness and freedom, the individuation of flora and fauna in the desert. Another very famous uh, photo from Zion National Park. This is uh, looking out along the Virgin River Basin um, out towards the south um, with the sunset off to the right. These are some beautiful photos, photo opportunities that will be offered for you upon these trips. <clears throat> and just a uh, taste of the gorgeous landscape that you'll be able to see on our trip together. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the itinerary. Um, Bryce Canyon, just some highlights. Of course, there will be plenty more, um, but we participated in a helicopter ride around the rim of Bryce Canyon and the uh, Markigant Plateau, as well as a uh, three mile hike down along the Queens Garden Loop, um, which is about 650 feet of loss and gain. The Queens Garden Loop um, drops you down below the rim of the canyon, down into these beautiful hoodoos, which are the main geological feature of Bryce Canyon National Park. This here is a photo of the hoodoo named Thor's hammer. As you can see, the capstone on top looks a little bit like a hammer. Um, these uh, beautiful geological formations are formed over millions of years through weathering and erosion and are the, as I said, the main feature of Bryce Canyon National Park. Um, the Queen's Garden Loop hike drops us off the rim and down into these intricate canyons in the amphitheater of Bryce Canyon. A beautiful opportunity, though it may be difficult for some guests, um, depending on mobility and things like that. A good thing to keep in mind. Some more uh, highlights of Bryce Canyon National Park. We'll have the opportunity to uh, view the endangered species of the Utah prairie dog that exist within the park. There are several colonies. Um, along the main area of the plateau. These uh, creatures have been losing habitat, mostly to overgrazing and land development, and are thus on the endangered species list. A wonderful opportunity to learn about that species and see them as well as the American pronghorn. Um, the American pronghorn can actually run up to 50 miles an hour, um, sustained over several miles, um, and this is due to um, their co-evolution with predators several thousand million years ago, um, the North American cheetah, which are of course no longer around. And so they can outrun clearly anything on the North American continent, beautiful creatures. Down to Zion, some highlights from our uh, time in Zion National Park. We'll do a uh, one mile walk along the Virgin River um, beautiful opportunities, as well as a couple of hikes through the Emerald Pools area and the Perouche Trail, um, which the Perouche Trail is that trail where I, um, of the famous photo I showed you earlier in Zion. Um, beautiful, beautiful area. Some details about these things. Of course, they're always, always good to keep in mind. Um, the majority of the hikes on this itinerary, um, vary between a mile and three miles. Most of them are rather flat. And so as far as natural habitat adventure, national park trips go, um, this is not too hike intensive, but important to keep in mind for uh, those preparing for the trips this summer. <clears throat> Zion National Park, here's a beautiful picture from the Angels Landing Trail. Um, some of my favorite parts about Zion are the, of course, towering majestic Navajo sandstone walls surrounding the park. Um, it's rather unique in that we spend all of our time in this area down in the base, looking up. And it, 
it's quite majestic, um, breathtaking views. Because of this unique geological formation, Zion National Park is home to a number of endemic species. Endemic meaning species that only exist, that evolved in this canyon and are thus only existing in this canyon. One such example being the Zion shooting star, which is pictured here on the right, a beautiful small wildflower that only exists here in Zion National Park. Moving on to the wildlife of Zion National Park. Here we are pictured desert bighorn that were reintroduced into the park back in the 60s and 70s. The uh, desert bighorn are considered an endangered population in Utah um, because of transferal of other diseases from um, other sheep and goats that were brought over by European settlers. However, the herd in Zion is now growing strong and has moved over into the main canyon recently. And so there's very good opportunities to see these wall climbers in their natural habitat doing what they love. One of my personal favorites here on the right, this is a canyon tree frog, um, another common resident in the park that can be heard down along the shores of the Virgin River or next to the emerald pools. These little friendly creatures sound a lot like bleeding sheep, if you didn't know what you were listening to, um, and uh, can be seen through binoculars and and found all over the place. <clears throat> Moving on to Grand Canyon National Park, um, depending on the time of year, um, there are, we have two different itineraries, one that takes us to the north rim of the Grand Canyon and another that takes us to the south rim. This is of course limited by the dates of travel that we are leaving on. So the, the north rim closes due to snow and uh, road maintenance between December 1st and May 14th, meaning that the first couple of our trips, those who are traveling in April and the early parts of May, will travel towards the South Rim, where we will participate in the Bright Angel Trail, parts of it. This is the famous trail, of course, that rim-to-rim -rim hikers will traverse daily, as well as the Hermit's Rest Trail, which is a um, top of the rim trail that takes us along um, the very the various um, out thrusts and features of the South Rim um, and ends at a beautiful uh, building designed by Mary Colter, famous uh, Western architect of the time, as well as the South Rim containing um, enormous amounts of human history, museums, uh, studios, in particular the Cold Studio. Um, which is positioned at the very top of the Bright Angel Trail, where the Cold Brothers famously uh, took photos of all the early expeditions down into the canyon as uh, tourism was starting to ramp up, um, a highlight for sure on the South Rim. For those traveling to the North Rim, um, they will be able to participate in a mule ride down along the canyon, as well as uh, another rim hike up there. Um, along what's called the transept trail. <clears throat> Again, um, these are just highlights. Um, your, your specific itinerary um, is up for interpretation uh, of your expedition leader, as well as um, input from guests occasionally. Uh, down along the Grand Canyon, we'll have the opportunity to see another one of my favorite animals, the California condor. And as many of you know, you might, uh, that the California condor is an endangered species as well. And we have gone to great lengths and a wonderful organization called the Peregrine Fund is leading the charge on the, um, the uh, re recovery of this species. Um, we'll be able to, along our itinerary, uh, see the various stages of rehabilitation of these animals. We will drive by the release site and hopefully be able to see some um, beautiful, beautiful birds, um, as well as the Kaibab squirrel that lives along the north rim of the Grand Canyon, um, a rather different color pattern um, that exists 
up upon the high plateau of the North Rim. <clears throat> Other locations that we will travel to in our itinerary, um, Kodachrome Basin State Park is a hidden gem uh, right smack dab in the middle of the central Utah desert that I did not know about for many, many, many years. Um, this state park was named for the film, uh, of course, the Kodachrome film, um, due to the striking contrast of colors, as you, as you can see in this photo of the, the lower and upper geological layers. Uh, some highlights of this area are unique geological features called sand pipes, uh, which only exist in uh, very, very few places in the world, as well as, um, of course, towering cliff sides of soft uh, dolomite and sandstone here. Another location that we will be visiting is Coral Pink Sand Dunes State Park. Um, this is en route from Zion to the North Rim. Um, and this area is a beautiful sand dune, as you can see, um, located in a large um, risen basin. There are a number of endemic species that live here as well. And for those intrepid travelers looking to check off some uh, very specific species out of their checkbook, we can go around and search through the dunes for the fabled coral pink sand dunes tiger beetle. Only living in here in uh, Coral Peak Sand Dunes State Park. <clears throat> So that is the uh, kind of a general itinerary overview. Um, of course, if you have any questions, uh, please type them in the chat and we will get to them here at the end. Um, in regards to the itinerary, I will now move on to a little bit more of, of logistics and kind of the nitty gritty of our trip here to Grand Canyon, Bryce and Zion. <clears throat> We're gonna talk about the climate and the weather. I'm gonna give a few packing tips uh, talk about arrivals and departures, um, money that you will need to bring, uh, the vehicles and accommodations, food and ethics. <clears throat> so to kind of set the stage for uh, how we're going to approach this trip from a logistical standpoint, the first thing that must be noted is the extreme elevation changes that occur throughout the trip. Um, I uh, did not include the elevations for St. George, but the St. George exists at about seven or 6,000 feet, 5,000 feet. <clears throat> and the first day we will travel up to Bryce on top of the Markagant Plateau, which exists at about 8,300, um, which is quite a difference in elevation gain and is going to be um, affecting all of us and our health, especially those who live at sea level or lower elevations. Um, this is important to keep in mind. Um, you're going to have a diff more difficult time breathing. Um, hiking is gonna be a little bit more difficult. And of course, the temperatures and climate are going to be colder. <laughs> After two days at Bryce, we will travel down to Zion. And Zion Canyon is positioned at 4,000 between about 4,000 and 5,000 at the base of the canyon. Anywhere, excuse me, up to 6,000 um, in the East Canyon. Um, but Zion Canyon is actually rather a, a, a temperate ecosystem. Um, I like to think of it as a hidden oasis of the desert, um, typically rather warm, um, low winds, um, and quite nice actually very different from Bryce typically. And then of course, uh, two days later, we'll head up to the North Rim or the South Rim. And uh, the North Rim and the South Rim are actually a thousand feet in difference from each other. The North Rim can be rather cold, um, thick and forested. The South Rim is actually um, rather desertous and warm and dry. <laughs> so these are the things that we need to keep in mind. Um, a lot of dry heat for those coming from more humid environments. This includes, uh, this implies that we'll need to take care of our skin, make sure that we're not drying out, drink plenty of water. Um, of course, because we are in a desert environment, we're going to, the earth does not retain a lot of heat. And so 
Uh, temperature differences between the daytime and nighttime can be rather drastic. This, this means that we'll have cold mornings, particularly at Bryce and Grand Canyon. And again, Zion being more temperate. Um, depending on the time of year that you go, um, temperatures can range from upper 40s and 50s in the early spring, April and May times, or October and November, um, to 80s and 90s uh, later in the summer. Of course, we don't run this itinerary in July and August because of those very extreme heats. And lots of sun. So what does this mean? Well, this means the layers, layers, layers. For those who have traveled and spent a lot of times in the outdoors, um, this is nothing new to you. Um, my recommendation is that you start with a layer of sweat wicking material. This can include um, typically uh, artificial fabrics. Um, my favorite, and I think uh, I would say the cheat code to the American Southwest is something called a sun hoodie. And uh, a sun hoodie is a base layer of sweat wicking material with a hood. And this is, uh, typically loose fitting um, in a lighter color always. And this is a particular neck, head and neck from the sun um, and is a rather versatile piece of equipment. Um, I would recommend to all. I had just discovered about a year or two ago. And so passing along this good information as best I can. Um, of course, on top of our sweat licking base layer, we wanna have a warm fleece. Um, we carry that in our backpack all day. And of course, a rain shell. Um, because we're not quite sure if it would rain that day. And we know that if we don't bring our rain gear, it definitely will. <laughs> Moving on, uh, I would recommend that everyone bring a sun hat or a wide brim hat. Um, protect those ears and the back of your neck, always important. Uh, of course, sunglasses. Um, and I would recommend, I'm not quite sure what the name is, but the, the brand name for those uh, pieces of string that you connect on the back of your glasses that keep them on, um, because there can be quite a lot of differences as we travel along throughout the day in sunlight. And so keeping those sunglasses available around your neck is always a good idea. Um, of course, lightweight breathable pants um, that are loose fitting, um, a lighter color to not attract the sun and make you very warm. And uh, lightweight boots or hiking shoes, um, depending on your preference. I personally. We'll go with um, ankle support whenever I can. Um, but I know others who prefer more of a free ankle, a lower riding hiking shoe, which is also um, a great option. But make sure that you break them in before uh, traveling with us. Uh, having a number of blisters from new boots is never, never, never fun. All right, luggage. So uh, on any given night have trip, on most given net hat trips, I should say, um, you'll have two pieces of luggage, uh, your day pack and your check bag. And so as we're moving along throughout the day, um, your check bag, if it's a travel day, we're moving in between locations, will be with our field operations specialist out of access from us who will not be traveling with us. So all those things that you don't need during the day will go into your check bag. Everything else will go into your day pack. This includes sunscreen, a water bottle, camera equipment, um, maybe that fleece layer, that rain chill I was talking about, an extra pair of socks, um, if you need any kind of special snacks, um, for dietary restriction purposes, anything that you would like to keep with you, of course, medications as well, um, that will go with your day pack. And that day pack will stay with you in the van all day long. And as we're moving in and out of the van to do various viewings, you may leave it in there or take it with you as you see fit. As I said, everything else into your check bag. <clears throat> and important to note on equipment, hiking poles, binoculars, and wildlife viewing scopes will be provided by Natural Habitat, Habitat Adventures. <clears throat> With the caveat, if you have a particular set of hiking poles, binoculars that you would 
love and you cannot be separated from, of course, you're welcome to bring them and use them. However, for your convenience, we have provided these things for you. They will be in the van wherever we go. Arrivals and departures. As I said, most guests will arrive through the St. George Airport. Um, this is for those who are doing so. Um, it's important to note that this is a small airport with uh, few accommodations. Um, it is rather far from the city. And so it's important on your day of travel that you um, have plenty of food to eat, um, unless you're trying to get something from a vending machine in the St. George Airport. Um, and that you uh, have confirmed your travel from the St. George Airport to uh, the hotel. Uh, guests who are arriving before day one uh, will have to arrange uh, their own transportation to the hotel, either from the airport or uh, wherever they may be traveling in from. Those arriving on day one will be picked up by our expedition leaders. Um, and so it's, it is imperative that you keep the Natural Habitat Adventures office updated with any travel changes if you are planning on arriving at day one so that those expedition leaders will have that information for when you will arrive and when they can come to pick you up. <clears throat> Departures um, will go from either St. George or Flagstaff airports, depending on your itinerary. Those North Rim travelers will depart from the St. George airport and those South Rim travelers will depart from the Flagstaff airport. Again, important to note, the Flagstaff airport is further from the city and rather small. And so accommodations uh, should be made accordingly. Money news. So important to note, all costs and gratuities of the trip are included in your initial um, fee to Natural Habitat Adventures, accepting your tips for your expedition leaders and field operations specialists. Um, the guidelines for tipping um, for our expedition leaders are included in your pre-departure briefing. Um, and of course, uh, if you're bringing extra money for uh, souvenirs, uh, books, things like that, that you would like to purchase for yourself, um, plan accordingly. Let's talk about the various vehicles we will be traveling throughout our adventure in the Southwest. Um, first off are two vans at the bottom. You will either be riding in a Mercedes Sprinter van um, or one of these turtle top Ford vans. Uh, pros and cons to either, um, but they are great wide windows, um, rather sizable. Um, of course, as we say on all Matt Hub trips, um, everyone gets a window seat. So uh, we have accommodated for the number of people and the number of seats so that there will be plenty of room in these vans. You should be able to bring, as I said, that day pack with your camera equipment. Um, if you wanna bring for those serious photographers or those photographer photography departures, <clears throat> um, a tripod um, or you know a, an extra lens that day, um, that shouldn't be too hard to accommodate. We can always, uh, keep your bag in the back during the day to retrieve. Um, but those would be our, our uh, traveling vehicles, as well as a helicopter that sits four people, including our pilot um, up at Bryce Canyon. Um, and of course, safety features will be gone over day of at the airport there. And then our other vehicle being a mule down the side of the Grand Canyon. Um, and this is important to note that there is a weight limit um, for that mule ride. Um, I want to say it's uh, 250 pounds. <laughs> um, and so important to keep in mind uh, and others who maybe don't want to travel with a mule down the Grand Canyon, um, you know, keep these things in mind. It is important to note, I should say that most, if not the vast majority of injuries that occur on a natural habitat adventure trip occur entering and exiting the vans. So it's very important um, that we pay attention when we're on uneven ground entering and exiting these vehicles 
And of course, your expedition leader will go over all these safety features of these vehicles um, day one of your expedition. Um, including in, included in this uh, free and open, this individuation of the uh, American Southwest is a lot of space between destinations. Um, this is important to note. Uh, I knew many guests last year uh, who did not know that there would be extensive driving times throughout this trip. And so, um, of course, here I have listed the different driving times between locations, an hour and 30 minutes between Bryce and Zion. Um, and then Zion to the North Rim is two hours and 45 minutes. Zion to the South Rim is four hours. And then, of course, South Rim to Flagstaff Airport, an hour. North Rim to the St. George Airport about two hours and 50 minutes. Um, this is, of course, not including the various stops and locations that we will be visiting along the way, which will be included in every single one of those travel days. And so we will be filling your days with incredible things to see throughout the American Southwest. Um, however, yes, yes, uh, Zion to the South Rim is four hours and uh, it, is, it is quite a ways. Um, but as, as we're traveling to the South Rim, an important thing to note is that we will be traveling through the Navajo Reservation. And this is always a great time to have a, a, a discussion about the largest reservation, um, the largest nation of um, peoples in the US. So these are our accommodations for the trip. Um, here you can see Bryce Canyon Lodge on the left. Zion Lodge on the top and the North Rim Lodge on the bottom. Um, I was not able to get a good picture of Katina Lodge on the South Rim, um, um, but rather similar. These are uh, beautiful lodges uh, that exist um, right smack dab in the middle of the park. An important thing to note, as an, um, <clears throat> when booking these uh, accommodations for you all, we prioritize proximity to the park um, and um, um, authenticity, yeah, proximity to the park, really. And uh, so some of these lodges uh, can be a little dated in, in regards to accommodation. Um, the Wi-Fi typically is extremely unreliable. Um, and Sometimes the rooms can have a little, some, a few quirks and things like that. And so this is important to keep in mind that we are getting you in the best possible position to maximize your time, um, to be able to see the most that you can see in this short amount of time that we have here in the parks. Another important thing to note is that uh, you, may, you may be able to stay in Bryce Lodge, Zion Lodge, and one of the Grand Canyon Lodges um, on your trip. But however, um, we were not able to secure these lodges there and of course in very, very high demand. And so on some departures, you may stay outside of Zion National Park um, in a, uh, of course, the next nicest hotel um, that's closest, um, the same with Bryce. Um, and so this is important to keep in mind. Um, food. Uh, all dietary restrictions can be accommodated. Um, we've never had any problems. Um, all the restaurants that we will visit along our adventure, uh, we have a great relationship with. They have always taken great care of us and have been very courteous when it comes to taking care of our people. Um, of course, if you have provided your various dietary restrictions to Natural Habitat Adventures, the expedition leaders and your field operations specialist will have this information on them. But it is always a great idea in the case of severe allergies, especially to confirm with your field staff at the beginning of the trip so that um, we don't miss anything. <laughs> and then last thing to note on uh, food and accommodations is that these park lodges can be understaffed and have been um, in the recent years past. So it's important that we're patient um, with their staffing and, um, and accommodating for us because these people are working very hard um, and not under the uh, best circumstances. 
sometimes. And lastly, I want to talk a little bit about um, some group travel ethics. Of course, we want to follow the leave no trace principles. We're going to plan and prepare ahead for our activities for the day so we can uh, accommodate all the emergencies that might arise. We're going to travel on impacted services. That means that we're not going to travel off trail, trampling um, the uh, plant and wildlife. Uh, of course, this is the desert and a lot of the flora um, has a difficult time growing as is until you put your boot on it and then it's gonna have uh, an even worse time. Um, and so we wanna travel on impacted services, leave of course what we find. Um, there's the old adage of leave only footprints, take only pictures. Of course, we're going to respect wildlife as well. Um, regardless of the actions of others around us, we will be respecting wildlife. That means keeping our distance. That means monitoring the behaviors of the animal. If, if we are changing their behavior in any way or stressing them out, we're going to create more distance from them. Um, we are in their backyard and we do not want to be um, stressing them out um, and causing abnormal behavioral patterns that might get someone hurt. And then of course, we're going to be courteous to other visitors. Um, again, parks can be quite busy in the uh, peak season of the summer and so we try our very best to get you to those locations with few people um, but there are times that um, that is not always possible uh, of course those who uh, are smokers we ask that you please uh, do that away from the group um, never around the vehicles or anyone else um, though i have never encountered uh, people who had a problem with that um, of course, on our natural habitat adventure expedition, um, we are there to experience this place, this amazing, amazing place that we do not have a lot of time in. That means that we want to limit our phone and electronic usage, especially around others where it might be um, uh, annoying or if you're taking a loud phone call in the van, this can disrupt a conversation that we might be having about, you know, the landscape around us. So just make sure that we limit phone usage and you might not have a problem with that anyway, because due to the remoteness of these locations, you probably won't have service. So um, I think I did mention before, but I will mention again, uh, the accommodations for those park lodges their Wi-Fi is extremely unreliable. And so if there are urgent um, you know, business or personal matters that you, need, you might need to take care of, it's important to talk to your expedition leaders about where you might be able to get the best service to get in contact with the people you need to. Of course, um, we're gonna be traveling in a group. Most of our natural uh, habitat adventure groups are between nine and 12 people which is very, very small, um, which means it's also very difficult to get away from someone that you deeply offended. Um, and so we want to make sure that we avoid touchy conversational topics. I'm talking about religion, politics, those things that might create a uh, undue rift in the group, uh, which we do not want. We're all here because we love the outdoors and we love um, the environment and we want to learn about these beautiful locations. And we don't want that to be soiled by some intergroup conflict or things like that. <laughs> and uh, that comes to the end of my presentation. Thank you all very much. Um, and we will, uh, I think, continue on to the question and answer portion. Thank you so much. Um, I am so jealous of anybody who's going to be joining you in the canyons this summer. It is such a magical place and one that always feels so otherworldly to me um i just i just think it's so so special so hope you all have a wonderful time this summer um before we get to the q a i just want to remind everybody that they can submit their questions via the questions field in the control panel um but let's dive in let's see here um Are there longer trips that visit both rims or is it just too great of a distance? 
So at this time, uh, we only have a North Rim itinerary or a South Rim itinerary. Yes, the uh, the travel distance um, between the North Rim and the South Rim is rather long um, and so difficult to accommodate at this point in time, yes. Okay. Um, if one of the guests drives their personal vehicle, can they leave it at the St. George Hotel for the duration of the trip? Yes, uh, I have had several guests do that um, and uh, had no problems with it. I would just make sure that you check in with the uh, hotel manager and let them know what you're doing, um, but there should be no problem there. Great. Um, so there were a few questions about the mule ride. Um, mm -hmm. What happens to folks who are either over 250 pounds and cannot ride due to the weight limits or folks who just don't want to ride? So those who, um, yeah, those who opt out for various reasons, uh, we'll provide alternative activities. Um, there's a couple of other hiking trails, um, the interpretive opportunities along there. And so you will be accommodated. Um, in fact, uh, I should say that most people choose to opt out of the mule ride, though we always offer it. Um, and so we will provide meaningful opportunities for those who do not. Great. Um, as you travel through the Navajo Nation, will there be any stops at museums or other culturally significant spots? Yes, uh, great question, actually. Um, I, so uh, one of our big stops down there uh, on the reservation is a, a place called Cameron Trading Post, um, which is kind of a hub down there. Um, where uh, you may be able to purchase any kind of arts and crafts from the reservation that are made there authentically as well um, and talk to a lot of people that live on the reservation itself um, and that's the the uh, rather large stop that we make there right next to the little Colorado River. Great. Can you explain what a sandpipe is? <laughs> Was trying to leave a little nugget for those uh, to travel out and uh, find out about themselves. Um, but I will say a, a sandpipe is uh, a lot like a hoodoo. So it's a vertical geological formation, um, but it's made completely different where a, a hoodoo was stacked traditionally as sedimentary rock does and then weathered in a fin pattern. Um, a sandpipe is actually a column of cemented very very hard sand <clears throat> left over from um, natural water springs that were pulling sand and then cementing them together um, in kind of a column and then as layers of sedimentary rock were eroded outside beyond it this hard column of, of uh, rock was left over very cool um Let's see here. This is an important one. Um, can you talk about bathroom stops? How often, you know, how how you handle those types of situations in the field? Anything you can share to help our viewers feel more comfortable that they will have opportunities and <laughs> um, be comfortable during their travels? Yeah, so um, a lot of our time will be spent um, at or near these, uh, these lodge areas, as I said, um, right in the center of the park. And so in, at those times, we'll be able to always accommodate, accommodate uh, bathroom needs and things like that. Um, the difficult times will, of course, be travel days. Um, and those will be worked in. As I said, uh, we do have a lot of stops on those travel days. And we have scheduled, uh, I shouldn't say scheduled, but we know where the bathrooms are and we stop at those. And uh, I don't think we've... Uh, had a lot of yeah and those are rather frequent so great um do any of the the nathab itineraries include the wave area in vermilion cliffs wilderness i wish <laughs> um <laughs> so what's what's hard about the wave um and i've i've actually personally tried to travel there many times um, but they have a lottery system and they allow only 10 or 20 people there a day, um, 10 that have had an online reservation before, and then 10 that receive a, a lottery day of. And so uh, that is very difficult. 
Um, we, there's no guarantee of being able to receive a permit on the day that we would travel there, as, um, as well as uh, geographically, it is kind of out of our way. Um, but I would say that the permitting system is the great limiting factor on that one. Got it. Can you talk a little bit more about meals? Are they served family style um, to reduce waste? Or if not, is it possible to share meals for those who don't have large appetites, just concerned about waste? Of course. Yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, yeah. So typically we will uh, all eat um, at a restaurant together um, and not, but not, not family style, but uh, I've had many guests uh, share food throughout the trip. Um, of course, you'll never go hungry on a nap half trip. Um, and this is true for the American Southwest as well. And so um, a lot of people, the best way I would say to approach that is to uh, to get with those you were traveling with or um, and and share food. You know, that is uh, that is a great way to deal with that. Great. Um, on the Queen's Garden Loop, is there an opportunity to turn around and go back rather than going the whole three miles? Yes, um, there is. I, I should say um, it, it does make it rather difficult on, um, on your field staff and expedition leaders when we start um, splitting up the group in various small groups. Um, though we we will accommodate that for sure um it is uh the queen's garden loop hike is is, is hard it, it drops off the rim on either side and so the the most difficult parts are the beginning and the end um and so yes you can turn back for sure um but uh yeah no yeah for sure you can and we'll accommodate that. Um, but is it, it is important to know that like, okay, I'm gonna get to the bottom of this hill at the very beginning and then decide to walk back and maybe not the greatest option. Um, so it's a little bit of like a, a commitment once you get down there, you know what I mean? <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thank you again for that fabulous um, overview of this itinerary. Um, let me turn it back to you for any closing comments you might have. Yeah, um, thanks, Sonny. Uh, I appreciate you all being here today. Um, thank you for uh, listening. I hope that uh, this prepares you and gets you excited for the American Southwest. I love this area. Um, I spent uh, a lot of my formative years in this area, and um, it, it holds a, a rugged, barren beauty that um, that I hope that you be able to experience with us. So I appreciate you all. And and I love that you brought up Edward Abbey in the beginning. It's it's mm -hmm. almost a must to to bring a copy of Desert Solitaire with you or read it beforehand to just enhance your senses to tuning into you know the subtle sounds and and beauty of that landscape. Um, it's just. Oh, it's so magical. So great book. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Please join us again next week for our next daily dose of nature. If you can, uh, you can check out next week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you all.